to welcome everybody to the Ortiz Architecture Meeting on August 15th. Um, let's see. I don't have a lot of updates. Um, the big thing is I've been, um, well, a couple things that have happened. I don't know if anybody uh, was aware, um, but GitHub was down for about an hour yesterday. Mm -hmm. right. Um and that was that was quite interesting. So that stopped a bunch of our stuff from running. Looks it looks like everything's all back to normal. But I thought that was interesting. That um, and I have not looked to see why um, it went down. If it was like a denial of service attack or mm. you know or what was happening, but um, it took down the whole thing. It wasn't just like the the web page. Um, but it was also all the backend repos were down, um, all the, um, uh, actions were down. So it was, oh. it, it was pretty, uh, substantial. Um, so, so if anybody sees any, um, news about what happened to GitHub, if you could post it in the discord channel, um, that would be great. Just to, was, to see. Was Trump doing another press conference on GitHub this time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe it got maybe it got his private crowd strike. <laughs> Revenge of crowd strike. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that has happened, and then another thing, um, kind of battling with is, uh, we have renovate that runs all the time, um, that keeps our dependencies up to date and. There in our Python code, um, there is a we have Fast API, which is like the um, the framework for the uh, a web server, and then that includes something called Starlet. Um, and right now there is a pinning um, a versioning range problem uh, between the two of them. Um, the pull request uh, is actually on the fast API side. Um, the pull request to fix it has been out there for two weeks, but um, fast API has like 384 approved PRs that are waiting to be merged. So we'll see when that happens. Wow. That's special. Uh, yeah, it's. <laughs> let me. Uh... If, uh, I, if you want, I can comment something on there. This call servers. The, the GitHub. Uh, yeah, on let, me, um, this call, let me share my screen. I'll show you what I'm talking about here, real quick. So here's the. This is the fast API, and if you look at uh, Starlet. Maybe, maybe it's been merged. I just was looking at this the other day and we'll see. Wow, 14 pages and we're going. Yeah, it's a, it's a very popular package. <laughs> um, <laughs> and a lot of this stuff is, you know, like a lot of it is just a, uh, looks like documentation stuff mm. um, maybe uh, here it is allow starlet so it's been approved uh, three weeks ago and right now uh, starlet has actually bumped to 382 um, uh, but the fix if you look at the fix that they have uh, it's gonna allow anything anything less than three nine so that will fix it but it's putting a kink into some of our um, our automated workflows that we have running for renovate so I'm in the process of trying to trying to another solution to um, get around that so hopefully I'll have that figured out today um, okay and I'll let you know what's, what's uh, happening. So it looks like what I have to do is 
um, put the uh, a rule into um, the renovate uh, JSON and roll it out so Starlet doesn't get bumped. Oh, cool. So Starlet again. Starlet is just an included package, so uh, it's, a, it, it's one of those indirect dependencies. Uh, okay, okay. It's so, me. if we actually no, look no. at, I it can show you what. More like a Marvel character. Yeah. <laughs> so, because we gather S bombs, I can show you what's happening. So these are um, these are all Python, uh, the MS ones. You can ask your question quickly about Otilius after you finish. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm almost finished. So these are all the the, the packages that are coming in, um, and we'll see that we have the the um, the fast API Starlet. So this version ah, that man. so this okay. version that actually built is uh, pinned to three seven two, but three eight is the one that fails. Uh -huh. um, and it, it's related to um, the this fast API. Okay. So we um, in, in our in our S bombs we don't show like the, the dependency tree, so we just show it flat. So mm -hmm. um, if you want to know the actual dependency tree, there's a Python command mm -hmm. that will actually you can run to go down and show the detail of of what's including uh, which ones. Um, you could kind of get it at uh, this level. So let me just open this project so you get a f feel for what, how, it, how it's kind of, how, how it kind of happens. And why I'm doing I this, test, our, yeah. I tested this, sorry, I saw the scorecard. I, I tested it on for my pies. Uh, the different images, the image you asked me to do, uh, just to give you feedback again, it it it, it does the same error. Okay. Uh, so in in the in, what we do is we have the high level requirements in. Um, so these are like the direct uh, packages that our Python program includes, um, and then from there we actually generate what is the hashed version of all the dependencies. So you can see, if we go to Starlet, so like these, um, the, these PDF ones are coming in via like different libraries and that's where it kind of shows. So six is coming in from a different, a couple different libraries. So you get a feel for um, the kind of the dependency tree. Um, just by look, uh, looking at the hashed uh, requirements.txt. That's cool. So, and, and we use the hash versions because that um, provides uh, more secure um, builds and prevents unknown um, packages from being introduced. So, and when we do the build, when we do the Docker build, we actually use the requirements.txt. Uh, to install all the Python packages, and if there's something, there's a bad hash in there or something, that whole build will fail. Yeah, so. that's good. It's almost like a hard coded, like you can only use you're using the correct package, right? Yeah. You can't get it. Worse. So if there's anything yep. different to that hash, it'll fail, like you said, right? Yeah. And, exa yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. And uh, and renovate, uh, update this hash automatically in our requirement or txt when it did a version bump. Yeah. So what happens is in our renovate, um, there's a, you could tell renovate to go ahead and update the, first go through and update the, the .in file um, with the high level direct dependencies. And then it comes back along based on, I believe it's, uh, I can't remember which one it is. I think the lock file maintenance um, or one of these other options. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's the pin digest um, is the flag that says go out and now take the 
the requirements.in and generate the requirements.txt with the hashes in it. So that's what's happening on that side of things, just to keep everybody up to uh, speed on that. I just ask you, Steve, but I'll tell you, yep. the, on the open source version, can you yep. change the user from admin? Can you create users or not? Or must you only, can you only use admin, admin? Uh, so like you can, you can um, using admin, you can create other users, um, but you right. can't create other groups other than... So in the Ortelius open source version, you have um, admins, users, and then everyone are like the three groups. But you can create whatever users that you want. Ah, uh, because yesterday, because uh, I'm at the point now with my Ortelius setup at home here yeah, of, I'm starting to play the Ortelius now. I'm actually using that, that cool command line that you created. And yeah. I actually added my, my first, uh, I added my first artifact or like entry, right? Um, and then I tried to delete it. And when I deleted it, I, I don't know, I got the, the Postgres database into a knot and it just sort of stuck there and I couldn't log back in again. And then I just waited until a new version of Otilius came out. Oh, <laughs> I just upgraded it and it just reset everything for me and I was back again. <laughs> uh, uh, we may have to just take a look at what, um, what <laughs> you're playing around with on, on that front. So I think um, I mean I this is from I, from my I need to go and just do some more homework on how to set up your Ortelia structure. You know, like uh, uh, for example, my fictitious company is called Panga Rabbit. So it'd be like, do you have like a hierarchy of like Panga Rabbit, then Panga Rabbit and applications, and then Panga Rabbit and then Helm releases? They'd be on the same level or something like that, right? I, I I'm just need I'm starting to try and learn the the hierarchical. And logical way of laying out your project, right? Yeah. Uh, and the yeah. command line works 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 great, man. Um, yeah. And then I want to start deploying applications, my own applications or dummy applications, into Ortilius and start practicing using Ortilius, right? And yeah. then I can write the next part of my blog, because my next part of my blog, I want to call it observability with net data, and then like observability, but then from an Ortilius point of view, right? Cool. Yeah. 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 So. Um... What you'll see is when you use the command line and add in your components, um, if you have an, an SBOM associated with those components, so if you've run SIFT or generated a, an SBOM mm -hmm. at any point uh, and pass that SBOM along as part of the, the CLI, what will mm -hmm. happen is if we take out the filter, um, we'll actually go out and create uh components that mirror to those um sbom dependencies so okay. and the reason why we do that is so we can then then associate um scorecard information with those uh mm -hmm. specific packages so right now um i haven't gotten to that point to go out and and grab scorecard for every single um sbom package um mm. but this is where we will be able to um, go out, find uh, the S, the scorecard for this component and populate it. So you have more detail what's happening at that level. Then also um, some, some projects are starting to um, publish their SBOM as part of their artifacts. Um, hmm. So when you have like a, a GitHub release, you'll have the artifact itself. Let's say it's a Golang package or, or Golang executable. And then along with that, they'll have their SBOM and some signature stuff. And we'll be able to suck that stuff in as well. The biggest problem, uh, we kind of talk, talked about this last time, is the disconnect between the artifact and the actual repo, the Git repo for the source. Um, because the two are, um, aren't, aren't always there. So if we go back up to some of these components, so like in Maven, yeah. in Maven, yeah. the, in the Maven POM file, the SCM, uh, repository showing where the Git repo is for the project, um, mm -hmm. is optional. So you don't have to code it in, in your POM file. 
so this and this is the thing that makes it, and same thing with uh npm uh, the node modules mm. it, it's optional mm. as well and it drives me crazy because let's say i find a bug in the font program yeah i i have no idea of where to go to the source code repository and open an issue yeah exactly I know that the I know that the that I'm using this package, but I have no idea where the source code is to even go fix it myself or open an issue uh, on that front. So it's just yeah. a crazy um, thing how people are so disconnected between the artifact and the source code still. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Because um, this is the part that I'm trying to get my wrap my head around is the structuring of a hierarchy, you know, for like, say you have multiple companies in here that you are managing, but using Autilius, right, to help help them, right? Yep. How would you go about doing that? Like, because you've got this global open source. So, would I like have something like um, global panga rabbit dot? I don't know what like, what is this one? This is open source Linux Foundation CDF Autilius, and then yeah. So uh, what would you have then for if you're adding another company now? You know, how so you, like, how... just to give you an example. So at the high level, we have the global. Global is like the, kind of like the root, and then yeah. I created just a, an open source domain. So yeah. as a a higher a higher level up than the Linux Foundation. Yeah. So at this level, so you could do a global open source, and then you have the Linux Foundation. Another one would be like the Apache Foundation, the Eclipse oh, yeah. Foundation. And then, like within the Linux Foundation, you're going to have the CDF, OpenSSF, oh, CNCF, okay. and then the project. So that's kind of how I structured um, this domain oh, structure. Okay. You and matching then, like, it to that domain, domain. What's it? Domain-driven design, right? Yeah. 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 So if we yeah. had, um, let's say, on um, the Apache side, uh, mm. Apache has. Uh, you'd have the open source Apache Foundation, and then underneath it, you could have like Tomcat. Yeah. So Tom Tomcat. Um, well, I think Tomcat actually is a sub project of another. High, uh, there's one in between, kind of like the CDF. So I think it's cool. maybe uh, Jakarta. Um, yeah. Maybe the one that's in between. So like, or the other one is um, Commons. So you know how like you have uh, HTTP Commons uh, mm. or, or, or Commons.lang, Commons.http. Those would mm. all end up being um, you'd have Commons as the in between here. Yes, that makes sense. No, it's cool so that you're going through this because I just wanted to get my head um, just you know straighter on how, on the hierarchical way of doing things, all well, the right way, right? Yeah. yeah. So. You could think about <laughs> yeah. So you can think about um, you know you have your foundation, um, and this could be replaced by a company. So um, yeah. you can think of the Linux Foundation as a company. Then within the company, you have different divisions. Yeah. Um, so like in the banking world, you have like the teller, you'd have the general ledger, you'd have yeah. um, the loan system would be different mm. high level projects within the company um, statements. Yeah. And then within statements, you may have smaller projects that break down even more. So you may mm. have online statements versus paper statements mm. um, or mobile statements, you know, so those are going to break down into smaller projects within that. Cool. No, that makes sense now. Thanks, man. That really helps. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing I would like to uh, ask about is storage classes. Does the Postgres the, um, SQL microservice support the storage class where you can point your database? Yep. To like, okay. Yeah. So, okay. um, yeah, I'm going to get out of this. Because um, I'd really like to have a permanent database. Um, on my, on you know, on your SAN, for example, and then it'll always just connect in. Or it doesn't matter if I wipe my 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 pods, I can always have, always have my data. Yep. I haven't connected this morning, so it's taking a little bit to connect up. There, um, there we go. So um, 
this, so we're looking at uh, the the cluster that's running the this UI here. So this is uh, the cluster that we're gonna we're looking at is for running all the the Artelius uh, hosted by Deploy Hub. So um, you see all of our different microservices um, yeah. here. This is the the ingress basically for the reverse proxy. Um, mm -hmm. And then we use a um, thing called PG Bouncer. Um, mm -hmm. PG Bouncer is kind of like a smart gateway to Postgres because the cost of creating a connection to Postgres is so, um, it, it, yeah, it's so slow. Um, what yeah. PG Bouncer does, it'll create these connections and then kind of cache the connections and route transactions mm -hmm. to an existing connection. So, so PG Bouncer takes the it takes the stress off your database not handling all these open connections, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, um, it's smart enough to close idle connections and done. Yeah. It's, it's like a smart gateway to Postgres. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so in this world, uh, in this the 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 SaaS version that we're running, um, the Play Hub actually runs a managed Postgres SQL on on Google. So there's okay. a um, uh, if you go into the Google pages, you go into um, the SQL part, you can see that there's actually a, a Postgres instance out there running, and that's a managed instance um, out there by Google. The backups happen automatically. All that stuff on the managed side is all done. Mm um by the cloud provider now this yeah. one here is um an, an orango um database so it's a stateful set oh cool yeah um, this is coming into the new hotelist right the, yep. the orango Gra graph graph right yep so in this hosted version we're actually running uh, two different databases so we're running the Postgres as well as the Arango. Um, so because this is a stateful set, um, you can see that it has two mounts. Mm -hmm. So this is where you're talking, Sasha. Stateful sets, um, you can mount uh, a, a, to a particular volume claim. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a persistent volume claim and then there's a the um, the persistent volume as well. And mm -hmm. what happens with the stateful set is when you delete the, um, and it, there's a re reclaim policy. Oh, you're using retain or? Yeah, it's retained for the reclaim policy. I, I don't see Makes it right now. So because yeah, it would when, suck if it was delete. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> The, the PVC um, has re reclaim policy of re retain. So what ends up happening okay. is if this stateful set is deleted and it's yeah. recreated, it'll connect back up to existing uh, PVC and you'll get cool. all your data back. Right. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to do, just but mimic that on my little environment internally, right? Yep. Now, um, instead of running the managed Postgres, um, you can run... Um, in our Helm charts, you can run Postgres as a stateful set as well. Okay. So I just need to enable that in my values, right? Yeah. So okay. when you when you enable as values, what you'll, what you'll see... Yeah, yeah. Do you have an example for me? Uh, I'll dig one up for you and point it to you. It should be out there in the uh, Artifact Hub. Okay, cool. But basically, what you're saying is that Rutilius does support that stateful set configuration for Postgres. Yep. Which is cool. Okay. Yeah, it should already be baked into the home chart. Yeah, I always go to Artifact Hub. It's actually really cool. It's a cool way. So, hmm. it will, you're using an internal uh, database. Ah. Or yeah. using oh, okay. external managed database. So, it'll, it'll, if you look, if you look in the uh, in the look for an internal database, and that will create the stateful set. Okay, so I'll just I'll just convert those values that command line, but just into values for yeah. Helm. 
yeah. then my 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 uh, Flux CD will pick that up and deploy it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Now, now the interesting thing with uh, stateful sets is, um, you can see we're only running one stateful set here for like a Rango. Um, yeah. So this is not a high availability scenario. So. Um, yeah. if, if something crashes the, the stateful set, um, the system will be down until, um, Kubernetes restarts the stateful set. Um, yeah. and the reason being is has to do with the volume claims. Um, so okay. in the volume claims in the storage class, uh, you can, there basically, you can only have one, one of the one member of the stateful set have right access to it. Uh, so you can't have uh, a right many uh, to the uh, same stateful set, uh, to the same PVC with the, defa with the default um, Google storage classes. So there is a way around it. So in Google, there's a thing called file store, which is basically okay. a fancy NFS server. Uh, so if you have that running and you configure that type of um, uh, storage class instead of the default storage class, then you can have multiple um, uh, stateful sets right to that, um, that, that NFS mount. And the NFS server handles all the traffic flow and the locks. Um, the same thing if you don't want to use file store, you could also set up your own NFS server and configure the volume claim um, that way uh, as, as that process. Um, file store is pretty expensive because like it's, you have to have like a minimum of, I can't remember like a, I can't remember if it's a, if it's a, a terabyte of storage you have to reserve or if it's like a hundred gigabytes. And then you got to pay for that storage even if you're not using it. So it's a little pricey yeah. for that level. Yeah, yeah. Storage is a tricky one, hey? I must say. Yeah, it's one of those. I think, I think they kind of wrote Kubernetes around this to have their default volume claim to be read only, you know, um, only one to write it to force you to move up to the cloud providers. Um, and you know fancy cloud storage you know the nfs file store based and aws has a has a similar uh, storage class um i believe azure probably does um so th that's how they get you to pay for things <laughs> mm. is but to get that some very benefit. nice there's some nice stuff coming out there like maya store and Ceph and these stuff and open 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 elastic block storage that you can do yourself, that you don't have to be roped in by these uh, providers. You know? but yeah, I, so, I hear what you say. They do. So, they kind of they try and narrow you into their sales funnel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so let's say you had a um, uh, a SAN, uh, you know, a network storage on your uh, a SAN network storage, and if you wanted to stick a, an NFS server in front of that then you can uh, configure the storage class for the stateful set to use an NFS type of um, storage class and point over to your NFS server in your SAN storage locally. Um, it's a lot of extra work. Um, it's great for high availability, you know, if you want to run a RAID mm. 5 and stuff like that on your mm, network. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, you know that it's totally doable, um, but it's it's a lot of extra steps. <laughs> mm. yeah, what about it, just running? Does does a cloud provider offer something like a direct attached storage? I, um, I've run that, but they don't have something like that, right? Well, what ends up happening to, is uh, the yeah. that's what ends up happening is the stateful sets through your volume claims will can attach to a direct uh, storage device to the mm. nodes. But only one can write to it at a time. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're still limited, right? Yeah, yeah. so it'll still work limited. if you only run one one in your stateful yeah. sets. Yeah, sure. So okay. in our case, for like testing and um, the high availability, you know, if this goes down for uh, 15, 20 seconds, it's not the end of the world because the front end will show that there is an error 
and you know we'll just have the person retry on that front yeah yeah so you 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 understand the risk and you and like it's like a risk versus how much you're going to spend to keep this thing up right and what's that what's that worth right is it worth it yeah like exactly. all the engineering that needs to go on in the background and and all yeah, yeah i see what you're saying all and the then there's and there's the managed it, you know there's just like with managed managed postgres there's managed sql there's managed oracle there's managed orango mongo all those can be mm. managed at the cloud provider yeah. side so that's yeah. the way to f to fix it by using an external connection yeah well that makes sense yeah. any other questions on that front no thanks for that yeah so arvin um yeah oh sorry no you go no um Oh, can I just know one more? Um, yep. I've been trying to get GitLab to do a Helm chart, but I think I'm going to have to book some time when I'm back with back from because I'm going to Santiago, Chile, and I'm actually going to meet Sergio nice. in person. Yeah, I'm going on Saturday. Um, but um, I've been trying to build a Helm chart, but you know, I'm making progress, but I'm also getting stumped and stuck with stuff, you know. Uh, so I'm just set up some time with you to figure that out. But I was thinking I could still integrate Ortilius into my GitHub, right? Yep. Uh, repos and get Ortilius up and running from that point of view to start to start getting that working, right? So I can actually work with Ortilius in a in an application. Yeah, yep, definitely. <laughs> yeah, just uh, send me a message on Discord and we'll figure out a time. Yeah, no, I'll, 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 I've got to respect your time, Steve. Well, I'll just book one in your in your calendar, man. Yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm interested to see what what you're running into for GitLab uh, and what GitLab what is, is clearly. I've gone down this whole rabbit hole because of there's no arm. Yeah. Right? So there is somebody who's doing one, uh, uh, who's keeping a arm image at Docker Hub up to date all the time. They have created it themselves, um, and I'm trying to write my own Helm chart to use that. To run GitLab on 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 a on a um on a on my Pi cluster, right? Cool. Yeah. So what yeah. you may want to do is look out to Bitnami. So mm. go out to Bitnami and see if they have um, a Helm chart for GitLab, and wow. so that will give you a, a Helm a starting Helm chart. You can you can bring down that Helm chart. And then yeah. you go in and modify that Helm chart so the image is pointing to not the the uh, AMD version of the image, but look at the um, ARM version that's on, you know, the other repo location for the ARM yeah. image. And that may be the and, easy way to um, cheat on that. Yeah, and, I, and that's a great idea because I wanted to do that using the GitLab Helm chart. But GitLab is, their Helm chart is quite, it's a bit, it's a bit static in how you can play with the images. You can't, you can't, you doesn't, they don't really allow you to do that. So I was taking a generic Helm chart and trying to modify that. But I think that's going to be an easier move, like you said, but not me. And I've just found it now. So that's a great, that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Also, also it looks like, um, let me share my screen. So it looks like out on Artifact Hub, there's a bunch of Helm charts out there. Hmm. I don't know which ones are any good. Yeah, I don't know either. So that's, I was making my own one. You might even see it there, but it doesn't work. It does work. It deploys a image, but it's deploying an Nginx image the whole time, which is because I'm using a, a generic Helm chart called one chart, and it's an Nginx image that it deploys, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to override that. Um, and I was just, I was just hitting some, hitting that kind of stuff. Yeah. So looks like the, I'd look at the ones that these are two years old, two years old, two hours ago. Yeah. <clears throat> because then I'll, I'll add that to the environment and I can start using a fully fledged intern, you know, on prem or self hosted, uh, but very powerful, um, the uh, SEM, right? It's awesome. But see, this isn't there easy? It's the easiest thing to do is just to get your runner to run locally. And then you don't have any, you don't have to pay any money. You can use the cloud version, but 
just using the runner to do all your work. I don't know Isn't how that, that um that works. How the the runners are connected and if you have to expose the runner to with a like a public IP address. I should check that out. Hey? I but, should have a look at that. Yeah. But for that we have to like it will take a lot of time if we are running GitLab runner in our own machine. It will use my machine as a runner. So all the job activation will take part in my machine, but it will take a lot of time depend upon the system we are using. Yeah, but I'm offloading the, you see, that's why I run my own cluster on my three pies. So I'll be offloading that resource requirement onto the onto my three pies, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can instead of GitLab, we can try Bitbucket. If the arm is available for the Bitbucket. Oh, no, not Bitbucket, man. It's a horrible thing. Yeah, yeah I would agree on that front. <laughs> it's the most terrible. It's the most terrible. Oh, my gosh, I hate that thing. I've used it too much. I never yeah. use that. That's why no, use you don't. Don't go. You don't go there. It's horrible. Like it's it's so locked down. They just force you. All they do is force you to go and buy a third party app and on their store. That's what. That's how they make their money. That's all they do the whole time. Yeah, there's so yeah. many people complaining there. It's just it's a horrible thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so okay. this one here, the. Uh... The GI uh, Jihu it looks like um, looks like mm. it may be a decent one to take a peek at. How old is that one? Ah, seventeen point two point two. That's very new. You see the. Okay, let me give and, that a go. But they are usually lighting now object storage instead of NFS for storage. Line, line uh, point number three. Yeah. And I think Sasha is using NFS. Yeah, that would be the the interesting. I don't Caveat. know what they mean. I'd have to actually go get into the 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 charts and see. Yeah. You know so what you may want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know what you may want to do is is um, take something like this one, and just mm -hmm. boot just boot your kind cluster on AMD. Yeah. And just, and just give just, it a test. Just give it a go. Yeah. Um, uh, on a on an Intel uh, kind cluster, and then just yeah. see what it looks like. And then once yeah. you get that working, you understand kind of like what you're looking for. You know, as far as ingress and and what's going to be running in with the pods and how the 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 storage is working. And then yeah. then you can uh, translate that over to your um, Pi system. Yeah, because I'm gonna put that because I know you asked me to investigate it, you know. To and I basically my whole goal with this is to a for myself to better understand Ortelius and to help other people deploy it, you know, locally at their own home, you know, so that they can get involved in the project easier, and also just to showcase Ortelius to the outside world, right? Like how yeah. how it works, how you can run it, right? Yeah. It's been a cool learning so, experience. So here, here's this other one, which is interesting. Um, a Docker Im image using install from source method as documented in the official GitHub. Uh, oh. So that, like this one, install from source would be interesting because uh, that would allow you to compile f on ARM. Oh, OK. What's that one called? GitLab dash it. Yeah. Let me go there quickly. Artifact Hub. Here, let me there. drop you the link. Thanks. Come on back to meeting. Or Rogan. Uh, chat. There it is. There. <laughs> huh. Thanks, yeah. Steve. So this, this is its own um totally own repo um mm. so it's interesting how they uh are setting it up so this one may be you have to take a look at a couple of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, i'll do that this <coughs> one is yeah 
Yeah, it's using a volume claim for the database, it looks like. Oh, that's good. So that's going to give you a, a stateful set, more than likely. Yeah, that's cool. With the using the default storage class, uh, it's going to it's going to use the ingress, which will fit into your traffic um, world. Yeah. Oh, I love my traffic. Uh, makes life so much easier. What is that? And it looks like it's using Postgres. And here's his, looks like their Docker repo. So there's going to be Docker um, images out there to build from Docker from base, uh, Docker from source. Yeah, I've got a Docker image that I can use. That, are, Like I say, there's a guy that keeps it up to date the whole time with ARM, for ARM. But he's built it specifically for ARM. There's actually a repo out there. Yep. That he keeps up to date all the time. So I'll, all, I, all I need is the Helm chart structure that I can override with this particular Docker image, and then it'll work perfectly. Because yeah. um, it needs it needs to it needs to comply as part of a Git uh, a GitOps method methodology, right? Because remember, we drew that really cool diagram. So I'm basically yeah. building that at home, right? The, yeah. I want to build. I'm building that, and then I'm going to add Harbor as a local registry. For people to mimic a local registry, right? Yeah. And then you could treat that as key, for example. So you could tell Harbor, sync Ortelius, uh, once a day, I want you to go and check uh, the Ortelius image if it's updated. And if it's updated, I want you to pull it. So yeah. I don't have to keep reminding you to do that. And then when I when I do a Docker, when I do my Ortelius deployment, it can use a local image. It'll be much faster, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Stuff like that. Um, I think for that, Yago yeah, has to. No, that, that, that's all I had. Yeah, I was looking the, at the main store dogs, and I think for that local volume, main store is actually uh, it's actually doing that. Uh, such as I am so looking into that their new dog. I said it in the chat. Okay, thanks, Alvin. Yeah. yeah, Steve, you are telling something to me. Um, I was just wondering um, uh, where we are at with the Figma for the new layout. I am experimenting. I will present you next week okay. because I have a long weekend. Okay. That is Sunday and Monday. That's why. Sounds good. But I definitely need some help. But I will first create a base layout. Then yeah, cre create the base layout and present it, and then we can talk about it um, on our next meeting. And we can uh, get yes. the whole team to, uh, to help you out. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, that's a good one, Arvin. I've, I've, I, I have not uh, seen Open EBS. That's an interesting one to take a look at. Yeah, I've been looking at that myself. Uh, Open EBS, um, because I've yeah. also got another crazy idea. I'm going to be getting rid of Ubuntu, not yet though, and I'm going to Ubuntu get rid of Ubuntu and use Tal OS, um, which is actually a Kubernetes operating system. It's the operating system is designed for Kubernetes, so it's super lightweight, super secure, and totally geared for Kubernetes. So I'm going to start running that on my Pi's. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. All right. Uh, anything else? Uh, that's all good. Thanks, Steve. Yep. And like I said, if anybody um, uh, runs across any details uh, about what happened to, to GitHub, uh, drop those in uh, Discord. Will do. I'm just curious to see what what uh, what really happened. If they're they're going to disclose 
if there was an attack or whatnot. But yeah. can you imagine if that was down for, you know, 12 hours? Can you imagine how many com how many million? Oh my word, that's so bad. I mean, there's wow. there's uh there's 350 million repositories in GitHub. What 350 million? Is that how many are there? That's yeah. insane. So can you imagine? Wow. Can you imagine just if just if if one percent of that was affected? So three and a half oh, million. Oh my word. You know, think how many do... industries must be affected? Yeah. It's insane. <laughs> Kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. So I, I ran across uh, just another tidbit, um, Sasha, that don't put don't do it yet, but it's an interesting oh, yeah. thing to throw down the uh, to take a look at down the road once you have your whole Pi infrastructure all up and running yeah. is because you're using Flux, it has a a companion product called Flagger. Oh yeah, Flagger. Flagger and Flagger, so you could use Flagger with Istio, you know, the, or um, what's the other one, Linkerd, for service mm -hmm. mesh routing, and it's yeah. pretty cool because Flagger will watch, allow you to do like a blue-green deployment or a canary deployment, oh. and it'll automatically track the traffic and adjust the percentage of traffic based on um, the monitoring it does automatically. I'm on it now, Steve. It supports traffic as well. That's so cool. Because, Steve, how cool oh, it would it be to have on the Otilius uh, blog, like all of this geared yep. together, right? How cool is that? It would be so cool because people can actually not just read about documentation, but they can actually come and see a project that actually is working and yep. that you can run this at home, right? Yeah, exactly. And I'm running it lean and mean, right? On Pi, so it has to be lean and mean. You can't, you can't just come here with your, your huge, massive, monolithic idea of dumping a massive, mass load of containers. That you have to write your software like tight, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, oh. uh, yeah. Steve, instead of Istio, can we use Helium, like the ISO valent? Um, right now, we have not put anything in for any fancy load balancing. Um, or um, stage deployments, just because the way we're, we're architected right now, because we have our Nginx um, reverse proxy and stuff, uh, that doesn't really um, scale to the type of deployments. You could do a blue-green, you know, bring up two different um, versions in two different namespaces, um, and then have the front end load balancer at the cloud provider route the traffic. But there's, um, it wasn't originally architected to um, utilize a service mesh or something fancier like traffic. Uh, because Istio is very complex. I tried to run, learn it once and it's very difficult for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's why we're, we're, we've kept it simple. <laughs> Yeah, I found this year overly complicated. That's why I didn't even bother with it. I just went straight to traffic, and um, I love traffic. I think it's just, yes, it works so well. Yeah, <laughs> really so cool. that's that's just another one to, to um, it, like I said, Sasha, it's way down the road. Um, and get everything else in place, and then we can get fancier with, with the different types of deployments and things. Steve, I'm looking at flaggers nice, eh? What a great it's, thank it, you for this. It's, per, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Super Especially cool. since it's, ah. it, it fits right into Flux. So. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, look, I've also been looking at a lot of Flux versus Ogre, right? Yeah. And like, and um, it's, it's been interesting because I've seen that Ogre CD have a thing called Acuity, which is the software as a service version, right? That you can go and pay and they'll set it up, right? Yeah. And like, and like, I'm like, I've read, I think I put it in, I think I put it in the Ortelius channel sharing content. There's a PDF that they wrote about the, the two differences, right? And Flux is great because it's boot, it's got a bootstrap, right? So it sets itself up down, right? But yep. Argo doesn't. That makes it very complicated to set up and from that point of view. But, but Argo does seem to be more powerful, uh, in the way it's been designed, right? Even though they're both doing the same thing. So I don't know. It's quite a difficult one to like, well, I think, I think with this flagger add-on, I think it's going to be 
pretty competitive with Argo CD. Yeah, so I'm oh, like, so you giving me this now is nice, right? Because I was like, this this could be a game changer, right? Um, I love Flux because it was so easy to get it up and running. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, so I think the the Flux with the Flagger, and Flagger, you install a CRD and stuff like that for it to control the 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 your deployment model that you want to follow and what you know metrics parameters you want to track as you do the rollovers of traffic. So it's um okay. it's nice. it's definitely interesting and i think it's going to be simpler than argo overall between yes. the two of them yeah oh, i found all that pretty complicated oh, sorry yeah. Arvin, well, you what was that arvin yeah it's not for the uh, we, for experiment we can try to run argo cd on top of flux cd so developer got the ui of argo cd and the devops engineer only deal with the flux well, that's the thing with um, wow. with the with Flagger. It has a way to um, monitor the progression of the deployment, so how the traffic's being split and stuff like that. I don't know if there's a UI for it. I didn't look for that. I just found this yesterday. Um, but that's there's ways to get the, the the details out of what's happening. And Flagger I think all of it. Could, UI. Yeah. I think I think it all gets pushed back to Prometheus or Grafana, so that would be your UI. Um, just on that, Steve. Um, so actually, that's what Gimlet is. Gimlet is the UI for Flux. So don't oh. don't you don't we we don't need Argo. We don't need yep. Argo CD. Gimlet that's is the enough. UI. So I've I've updated. So that's what I was doing with the. I updated my blog. Yeah. Um, on the on the Otilius blogs now. Um, I went to this page the, this weekend that's just gone by. I overhauled the whole thing and I made it the way it should have been done with Hugo. Um, and the whole point of it was because I wanted to show people how you could incorporate Otilius into your into a GitOps in scenario, right? Yep. So, but I needed that piece. It was I was like stuck. I was like, okay, I have to figure out what am I using here, Argo or or, or or Flux? And Gimlet put me onto Flux because Gimlet is the UI to Flux. And that's all in the, my blog. And then, so developers can already see what is going on release-wise and customization-wise. And then with Flagger, you could make it even more rich, like you say, right? Putting all the dots together, you know, all the amounts of traffic coming in, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, so that's yeah. very cool. Thanks for this, Steve. This is actually really great. Yeah, I was just trying to see if there's a... And I also figure if I can, if we can have blogs like this too, showing people how things work, you can drive more p interest to your site, right? I mean, that's that's, that's kind of also one of the basis. Uh, yeah, I think we should create a dog or like a GitHub issue, so like we can't, so so that we don't skip any details. Yeah, that's what my blog is for. Uh, I, I'm doing each one detailed, each piece is going to be detailed. There's my observability. From a, a, a Otilius point of view, and observability. See, I don't like. I, I think Grafana is amazing. Hey, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not trying to diss them, but I don't like the fact that you have to be an observability engineer just to get us some metrics. Right. So that's why. That's why I don't like it. So why? What I use is net data because I don't have to go and reinvent the wheel. I get a pair of mags for my. I get sports wheels straight out of the box. I don't have to go and rewrite a whole bunch of like templates and crazy. Prometheus language, I don't need it, any of it. That's what I run. I run net data and it's straight out of the box and I get it for free. It's amazing. So those are the two portions of observability I'm going to focus on. One is the monitoring of the infrastructure and the other is the monitoring of the application uh, using Otilius as that, as that piece, right? Yep, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And all the stuff I'm doing is free, except for buying yourself your own domain, which I did. A, I did number four now with Cloudflare, right? How to integrate Cloudflare with Traffic. Yeah. I Everything want to now. experiment with Cloudflare mm -hmm. workers. I have heard a lot about it, the Cloudflare yeah, workers. Cool. I, heard I think cool. I will create a Next.js application to try it. It's a huge, huge company here in South Africa. They're global, international. They're called NASPAT. They own so many companies, even overseas. Um, uh, and they use Cloudflare workers, edge computing, to handle a lot of their um, workload. 
So before it even gets to their infrastructure, right, the origin servers, having to do any work, Cloudflare is handling all of it, a lot of it already. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, I learned a lot, and thanks for all the great tips. Um, <clears throat> Sasha, are you um, just one last quick question? Are you uh, are, mm. for your get for your GitOps? Are you using Customize at all, or there's no Customize. need? Customize. Well, I don't. I don't need to use it because uh, you can. But uh, because um, uh, Flux comes, Flux uses Customize under the hood. Oh, that I okay. To, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It, it, to do all its patching, right? Yeah. So if I go and look at the pods for uh, uh, flux, flux system, I have three controller, uh, four controllers, a source controller, a notification controller, a customized controller, and a helm controller. Got it. And it's all just connected to my Git repo with a key. And um, all I do is create these my helm all i have is two i have i have one i have one repo for my infrastructure and i have a helm release folder and i have a helm repo folder the helm repo just sets up the repo where is this repo right and the releases is where i do all the configuration yeah 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 oh, gimlet is um, a hungarian company and the guy gave me because I wrote the blog for him, they knew, and they're building this great UI for Flux. Uh, he gave me uh, he gave me free access to his cloud version, the cloud one. So I'm using the cloud one, but it's the same. You can self-host for free. It's the same UI, all the same stuff, right? So he he's building on top of Flux this UI. Right. Yeah. I have to also ask him for the. Uh, Devo, uh, because I got an error yesterday, two days ago. Yeah. While deploying a React application, but I have seven days to try it out. So yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. see. They've got some good examples there. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think I might have to upgrade my storage. That's the. Biggest so headache for me at the moment is storage. Alrighty, guys, I can run to, to another meeting. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Alvin. Right, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you, Bye. Steve. We'll see you. Have a great day. Bye bye. Bye. bye.